welcome to the Personal Development Mastery Podcast. I'm Aggie Keramidas and my mission is to inspire you to rise up, grow, stand out and take action towards the next level of your life. I interview leaders, influencers, entrepreneurs, authors, exceptional people who can and will inspire you to improve your life. Tune in for two episodes each week and make sure you subscribe to the podcast to get the episodes as soon as they are released. In today's show, I am delighted to speak with Sophie McLean. Sophie, you are an internationally renowned wisdom teacher, author and speaker. If I said that you had an eventful life, it would be quite an understatement. Uh, You have been a helicopter pilot, a teacher, a designer, a relief worker, a war refugee, CEO and a United Nations representative. As a wisdom teacher, you have spent decades working with tens of thousands of people worldwide, examining and deconstructing the human network of beliefs, emotions and ego. Your mission is to contribute to the creation of a new culture for humankind, the shift from homo homo sapiens to homo spiritus, as Dr. David Hawkins wrote. Sophie, welcome to Personal Development Mastery. I'm, I'm grateful to, to have you uh, with me today. Maggie, I'm so happy to be with you, get to know you, and I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. So am I. Uh, Sophie, French, born in uh, Al- Algeria, educated in Morocco and France, worked in the USA, in the UK, so it's a privilege to tap into your wisdom as well, and also... Uh, even more importantly, be able to share that with uh, the listeners. So thank you for that. <laughs> Very welcome. Um, I would like to start with your story. So you say that when you were uh, 33, you had a profound uh, transformational uh, experience that changed the, the direction of your life. Uh, so I would like you to Give us some background and uh, st- to realize how you became uh, a you wisdom have. teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, it started before that. The first gift I received, Aggie, was when I was 11 or 12. And I was um, in my garden in Casablanca, Morocco. And I was, uh, my family was on the terrace getting ready to sit down for dinner. And I was at the end of the garden in a moment of stillness and quiet. And I was just watching them. And I had um, an epiphany, like a gift, you know, like a download. I I didn't do anything for it. It, it. I really hold it as a gift. And I got a few insights. The first one was that I was being brought up in a cocoon, very protected, and that was not a reflection of the world. That in the material plane on our earth, there was a lot of suffering, uh, inequalities, there was a lot of joy. There was many, many, many different things that I had no idea about. So that was the first insight. You know, and when you're 11 or 12, you think that you're community is the world, right? So suddenly I thought, oh, I've got to go out in the world and just discover everything. And then the next uh, message I got was, and all of it is an illusion. And I actually saw it. I actually experienced it all as a theater play, right? So I ran to my parents. And I said, do you know, do you know that? We call reality is not real. <laughs> and they gave me my nickname, the crazy one. And my nickname is still with me today. Uh, with much love, but they really thought I was losing it, right? And then the third thing I got was that I had a mission and I must recognize it. Now, I didn't understand that. I I just, well, well, what am I supposed to do? How can I recognize it? I I didn't quite understand. Okay. So then I went on growing up and and I had a lot of uh, tragedy. Uh, Between the age of 15 and 28, I was raped. Then I fell in love. I got pregnant. I lost a child. And then my husband died. All that in 10 years, right? 
So needless to say, I promptly forgot all the messages I got and I went diving into despair and suffering. And for five years, I, or four years, I suffered. I suffered and I can, you know, I am Mediterranean. I can suffer, you understand? I, it's all our drama, right? And, um, and I remember the day I was uh, 32 years old where I said I was in Oxford, England, and I said to myself, I was in front of a mirror. It's one of those moments of truth in life. And I said to myself, all right, you either put an end to your life, which was not an option for me. Suicide is not an option. I would never do that to people around me. Or you go back to life. But being a vegetable, no, that doesn't work. So I packed my bag, left the house I used to live in with my husband, left my job, left everything and went around the world. And I went around the world, um, the Grand Canyon in the U.S., then Tahiti, then New Zealand, across the South Pacific. I got shipwrecked on East Island. I went to Chile, Argentina. I mean, I went around the world and I landed up back in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, I met someone from Casablanca who introduced me to a master. And uh, he provided for me, <laughs> you know, the, the biggest uh, epiphanies are the simplest, right? I was um, uh, crying and back in despair about uh, everything that happened. And he said to me, what is the meaning you attach to your husband's death? I said, well, I'm doomed. I'm doomed. And it's not only my husband's death. He said, Look at everything that happened to me. I must be doomed. And he said to me, is that your meaning? Or do you think that's the truth? And he never stopped until I finally understood that. I am doomed was a story I was making. You see, the fact that my husband died didn't mean that God didn't love me or that I did something bad in a previous life or that my husband didn't love me. No, my husband died meant my husband died. It, it, it doesn't mean anything else. And when I realized that the source of all my suffering was in what I was saying about what happened, in that moment, I, it was, I think, the last time I suffered in my life. I got that suffering was optional. It, it depends on the story I attach to what is happening. And it was so good, Aggie. It was so delicious to capture back the illusion and the insight I had when I was 12 and to be able to grieve my husband without suffering, just with pain. I mean, pain is bad, bad enough. You don't need suffering on top of that, that I wanted to give it to everybody. So I threw myself into studying and philosophy and ontology and Buddhism and Hinduism and tantric yoga. I mean, everything that I could to be able to give it to other people. That's my story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. Uh, I have many questions coming from that. Uh, you said the, there was something that I, um, I enjoyed very much. What you were saying about the pain and the suffering, which uh, many people think it's the same thing. And uh, I remember mm -hmm. that phrase that pain is inevitable in life, but suffering is optional. And you said it, it is. very well. It's the the story we repeat uh, to ourselves and identify it, it's, uh, the event itself is objective. It has no meaning apart from what we give to it. That's right, Aggie. You see the earth, when there is an earthquake, the earth doesn't suffer. <laughs> when you see a dog with three legs, you never hear a dog saying, oh, my life is over. Get me a therapist. No, the dog runs as mm -hmm. fast as he can to keep mm -hmm. up with the other one. But it's, it doesn't make it mean anything that he lost a leg. But human beings, oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> so, we can make up any story. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would like you to tell a bit more about this uh, latter part of your, of your journey into into spirituality, and tell me a bit more about your uh, realizations, or maybe if there were there any uh, transformational moments. Yeah. So then, uh, as of thirty three, I threw myself into really uh, studying what it is to be a human being and uh, what the ego is, right? Because people have a very strange idea about what the ego is. They think it's being arrogant or being a jerk, but not at all. The ego is everything you identify with, which is not who you are. So anything outside of yourself, that's ego. and, And it's vast, right? Okay, so I threw myself in that for 15 years, worked an enormous amount, uh, traveled the world, um, led to about 80,000 people, and and I loved doing it, right? I led seminars. Uh, it was great, and there was something missing. There was something I didn't have time to to inquire, and I knew there was something missing, and I knew it was my connection to the divine. Um, and um, so I, in 2009, I stopped and I said, no, well, I, I, you know, 2009, I was 49. Uh, I, I just said, okay, yeah, I have to, I, I have to follow this, this impulse, right? So I, uh, I just went, I stopped working again for uh, six or seven years. And I, again, Traveled the world, went to the Amazon forest. I went to spend two weeks with the Dalai Lama in uh, Ladakh. I um, went to India to the Kumbha Mela for two months. I uh, met gurus, shamans. I um, had the most extraordinary experience, out of body experience. I even tried ayahuasca, um, had the most extraordinary um, um gift again messages um and uh and because i had done this training before on on understanding what the ego is i can have spiritual experience mystical experience past life experience i mean really i had the just it's extraordinary but i don't get addicted to them because i don't add any meaning to them So, so when I have one of those spiritual experiences, it's for me more like um, getting the gift of having a map. I know what's possible. I know what's possible in the spiritual because I now have an experience. And then when I come back in my body, I still have to be responsible for being in the material life. But now I know what's possible. So, so it gives me a kind of map to let go of everything that is not what I have experienced. The danger of those experiences is that they feel so good that I think many people get addicted to them, right? And their entire life is about having an experience. But for me, that's not what life is about. It's not about having those experiences. It's about being gifted those experiences so that you can elevate yourself inside of your body on the material plane. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 yeah. Otherwise, become a monk or a nun, right? I mean, that, that, but it was tempting. I promise you, it was really tempting to go in a cave on the hill of the Himalaya, not talk to anybody and spend my life into this kind of marvelous nothingness mm-hmm. and exquisite love. But um, this is not my mission. <laughs> so let, let me ask you something. Uh, you said something earlier, and I, I'm sure someone wondered probably someone else, I have wondered as well, you said uh, that the ego is anything outside of yourself. Mm. So someone would wonder, so who is one side and who is the other? What is, if my, outside of myself, how is myself outside of myself? So I would, I would like to, to explore your, yeah. your, your, you know, uh, take of this uh, <laughs> yeah. question. So, So let me create it for you, right? So there is, you could say there is three dimensions. I'm going to make it simple and a bit um, 
a bit uh, too simple maybe, right? But it's easily, uh, it's easier that way. So there is a divine. The divine for me is a context of it all, right? And the divine, it's non-linear, it's outside of language, it's outside of time and space. I mean, you can't talk about the divine. It's a total mystery. Um, I, the best description I get about the divine is like a breath. It breezes out and it creates, it breezes in and it's uh, the creation disappears. All right, but you can't talk about it. You can only talk of what is not the divine, okay? So that the, the divine in the context of it all. So at one point, not in time, but the divine breezes out and creates what I call the quantum field or the spiritual field. And that's where um, also outside of time, outside of uh, the five senses, no language. This is the, the dimension of the souls, the spiritual being, um, everything that is uh, uh, non-linear, not materialized, you know, difficult to talk about, but easier to have an experience of your soul than it is of the divine. And then at one point, the soul incarnates in the body and we are on earth and there is the whole earth school to uh, go through. Now, who we really are is our soul incarnated in a body. Do you know, 85%, I think Deepak Chopra said, 85% of the world population be, believe we have a soul. And nobody talks about it. Did anybody talk to you about your soul at school? No. Right? But this is who we really are, this soul, this kind of essence. And it's quite easy to have an experience of it when you... Um, for the people listening on this call, if you close your eyes just for 30 seconds and you let yourself look at your life from the moment you're born to now and look at everything you did and all the people you married, divorced, remarried, children, work, traveling. I mean, it is so busy, family, money. Um, cars, animals, passion, more work, right? It's busy, 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 busy. It always moves and it's very noisy. Now, in the background of this life, there is a presence that never changes, never alters. Right in the background, that's who you are. All the noise in the front is just life. Who, and you know, this is why, Aggie, I'm, I'm 60 year old, right? And I have now the look of a 60 year old woman and the body of a 60 year old woman. And sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and say, who's that? <laughs> because I have never changed. My body is changing, but not me. So, so if you identify with your body, then you are going to suffer. If you think you are your body, you're going to suffer. That's the ego. If you think you are the amount of money you have, if you think you are the nationality you are, if you think you are your gender, if you think you are your car, your title at work, being a wife, a mother, a husband, anything you identify that is a human construct is the ego. Now, you are not that. And the secret to be free is to know that we do need an ego to go through life in the material world. But it's very different. An unconscious ego, automatic ego with no awareness, like it will be like you really believe you are your body. Or a conscious ego, which is. You know it's a story you're creating, like I was not born a wisdom teacher. I made it up. I made up the title, and this is not who I am. This is the conscious ego I have created for myself to be able to say, to answer when people ask me, what do you do? And I say, okay, I'm a wisdom teacher. But I know it's not true. <laughs> Therefore, I'm free. You see, in two years' time, if I can't be a wisdom teacher anymore, I will not suffer. I will create another ego. That, that's, <laughs> that, that is what I mean. Oh. It's a great way to describe it. Thank you for that. Uh, I liked uh, you, you use the phrase that the presence that never changes. And I think that speaks 
beyond just the intellect. So mm-hmm. that's great. Can I ask you something you were saying about the people that who really believe they are their body? They have completely identified with their ego. Mm. Mm. How can these people start shifting? Is it a matter of not the right timing for them yet? Or is it uh, the understanding that there is a, a, a different level to life, a spiritual level? Is it only for some? I don't think so, um, Aggie. Let me let me think about your question. It's really good. Um, you know, the, in Buddhism, they say that the source of all suffering is that human beings do not know the perfection they are, right? So the people that are not seeking to remember who they really are is because they really don't know. And that I, you know, with all the people I worked with, all this resistance, this uh, mistake of of identifying with something external to yourself, it really is the source of, the source of it is ignorance. If people knew what was possible, Aggie, nobody will stop, right? So it's just they literally don't know and they don't know they don't know. Okay, so that's one thing. So how do you make a difference, right? So it always starts with you because, you know, this um, word self-development is has sometimes a bad vibe. But for me, I don't call it self-development. I call it collective fulfillment because if I'm somebody that operates in the space of love, wherever I am and whoever I am with, I will bring the space of love not for myself, for everybody, right? So this internal work that we do and more and more people do is not self-centeredness and selfishness. And the Dalai Lama said it beautifully, he said, uh, if you seek enlightenment for yourself, you are a fool. And if you seek enlightenment for others, then you are wise. Right, So it's collective fulfillment. So that's the first thing. You need to deal with yourself. You are responsible for yourself. Nobody's going to take care of you. You need to remember who you really are, and then you'll be a useful human being. Then I see it um, at the moment I am in France because my father passed a few weeks ago, and I'm uh, with my mother and sister, and we spend a lot of time together. And you know how you never prophets in your own family, right? I'm still the crazy one in my family. I have a huge following and all that, but at home in my family, I am the crazy one. Okay. But during this time of of sorrow, they look at me and they see that I have pain, but I don't suffer. I am totally aligned. I I I can cry and and go through the pain and then come out on the other side and they deal with the suffering you know you lose somebody i should have done that i should have done that and you add some guilt to it and you regrets and and uh, but they intrigued because i am aligned so my mother and my sister came to me little by little and little by little they started to listen to the the distinction between pain and suffering and all that. And, you know, it's been just a few weeks. And I, it, people, are, it's absolutely delicious. Uh, my mother, my 83-year-old mother that has lost her husband of 67 years, is not suffering. She has pain, but she's not suffering. So, you see, this is how to do with people that are that don't know what's possible, right? That you need to literally wait until there is a window of opening. And if you listen, you will get it and know how open the window is. Don't go like a full <laughs> bulldozer, right? Just yes. listen to how much you can take. And that is how we make a difference. I get it. That's great. Thank you. And there was something that you said about the, the self-development as uh, a term and, you know, the negative uh, connotations that there are sometimes with it. And uh, I liked very much what you said about collective fulfillment. And I remember a few years ago, I was always thinking of personal development as something for me because I took the word personal 
literally. And it was at some point that something clicked and I realized that my personal development is not for me because I'm not, you know, individual. Mm-hmm. I'm part of the collective. So if yeah. if I grow, then everyone in my radius will uh, benefit from that. So it's a collective uh, indeed, which... Uh, mm-hmm. It's a great way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, when we say a personal development, personal, it's like personality, character. That That is the ego. Everybody has co- constructed a character as, from a very young age, right? And a personality, you can call it or you can call it an ego. And if you believe that character is real and the truth, then you will work on the character. But the more you work on the character, the more the character will be there. And that's why I think self-development has a bad vibe because people are like a dog chasing their tails, <laughs> yes. trying to analyze and fix and improve and change their ego. But the only thing you need to do with the ego is See what it is and then do not do any work on it. Stop putting energy on it. Stop. <laughs> um, tell me, Sophie, I'm thinking again about uh, the ego, what you were saying earlier. And uh, I would like to explore more your thoughts on how can one start to understand more the nature of of ego and how they can deal with it. I I wouldn't necessarily use the word transcend because of what it it means, but, you know, someone that wants to do more work, that realizes that. Someone like myself, for example, that Mm. I have more, shall we say, intellectual understanding of this topic rather than, you know, actual uh, experiencing of the topic. Yeah. All right, I'll tell you why it's a difficult question, okay? Because... Uh, I like uh, difficult it, questions, Sophie. Uh, it's, it's only difficult for me. I just... <laughs> uh, okay, this is a difficult part in my podcast. Okay, so I I have studied with so many people, and I really can say without any arrogance that I know the ego. I am an expert in the dismantling of the ego. So... I have created courses. That's why I say it's difficult because now I'm going to talk about my courses. I am sure, Aggie, that there is many other ways to to let go of the ego because uh, to distinguish your automatic ego because mm-hmm. people do it. Okay, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so the, the, you know there is from hypnosis to meditation to um, I mean books to read philosophy. I mean there is many, but here's um, what I like about mine, in, it's in five months, you are free from your automatic ego because I, I know the design of what it is to be a human being. So it's pragmatic, it's fast. And I can give it to you on this podcast if you want. It's, it's actually quite simple. There is four pillars to the ego, four mm-hmm. main ones. There is many other things, but there is four things that you need to get to start being liberated. The first, so you need to imagine your life like if it was a theater play. Okay, what do you need for a theater play? You need a main character. That's you. Okay, you need a supporting cast. That's the main character relationship to the supporting cast. By the way, the main, main character of the play never gets fired, but the supporting cast, you can <laughs> fire at will. <laughs> okay, so now you have the actors, the main character and the supporting cast. Then you need a script. So it's your relationship to the circumstances of life. If you look at your life, you will see that you attract the same kind of circumstances over and over and over again. Everybody has a different script. And then there is the the setting, the like the, the whole space you give your play in, like the genre, right? So for me, I had a tragic 
a tragedy, a Greek tragedy, now that I'm talking to a Greek man, right? I was, I mean, oh God, you name it, I had it, right? But some people have a romantic comedy, somebody can have a thriller, somebody can have an intellectual kind of film, movie, a uh, play, right? So those four things, when you examine your life and you find out how did you create the character you identify with, how did you create your relationship to the supporting cast? How did you create your relationship to the circumstances of life that you attract often the same one? And what is the genre of your life and where did you put it together? When you get those four things, Aggie, your life is transformed. Because your awareness has elevated to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And I wonder in how much depth one can go once they start to you know explore this uh, thing, under this uh, point of view of everything being like a, a play or a, yeah I think that's what's uh, yes that's uh, I'm kind of uh, trying to uh, think about it myself now while I'm speaking that's why yeah. well Aggie I, I have designed you know I'm so committed to create a new culture for humankind that I actually have designed a 21 free email course it's free and you get my book for free, audio book. And the whole book is a construction of the ego. So all, I mean, I'll send you the link if you don't have it. It's called The Call of the Soul. And when you do this course, again, I want to say it, it's free. So just get it. You'll receive 21 email and um uh, you you will understand the 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 construction of the ego. That's why I gave it away for free. I have now thousands of people that have um, done it. I, I just uh, put it out in January. I'm very excited about it. It's very powerful. Um, so if you want to know more about the ego, go and get that. Absolutely. Uh, I, I will put the, the link in the the show notes as well for uh, people to check it out. Um, I would like also to speak about your mission. What uh, I very briefly said in the introduction, the, the, the new culture for humankind, which is something that I'm personally very fascinated about, especially at this era that we're living in, where things seem to be going to a very dark direction if we put our attention there. So I would like to ask you, first of all, where do you see humanity going or where would you like to see humanity going? I, I, I think we're living the most fascinating time. I think it's the best time to be alive. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you why, okay? Mm -hmm. Because there is a shift. From Homo sapiens to Homo spiritus. So that, that Homo spiritus is from David Hawkins, and I really don't want to take credit from it, but it was so perfect, I say it all the time. So if you look at the Homo sapiens, Aggie, that's the reign of the ego, right? So at one point, long, long, long ago, when we lived in caves, we had to learn how to survive because the human being, like the, all the animal kingdom, don't have an internal energy system. We have to look outside of ourselves for food, for water. We had to learn to survive the animals. We had to learn to survive the weather. And we did. How I know that is we're still around. Some species didn't learn. They're not here anymore. Okay. So that was what the survival system was about. The survival system that we now call the ego. And then at one point, and obviously I do not know when, the physical survival shifted to the ontological survival. Ontology is the art and science of being. It's what it is to be a human being. So human beings started surviving each other, surviving their story, surviving their meaning, surviving an illusion. And it gives us so much 
I mean, we put a man on the moon, E equal MC square, all the progress in medicine, science, technology. It's amazing, right? All that was to survive, to survive, to survive. Great. I mean, look, uh, there is less poor people now than there was before, right? Okay. But like everything in the evolution, right? It comes a time where the 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 worm has to become a butterfly, right? So the worm gets into the cocoon, and I don't know what happens in the cocoon, but I hear that the worm actually literally becomes all gooey like mud, and and everything dissolves. I mean that that must not be pleasant for the worm, okay? <laughs> But what comes out is a butterfly. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we're in the cocoon as a human being. You see, any birth happens always inside of pain. I mean, you'd ask any woman uh, giving birth naturally. It's not just a walk in the park, right? So I actually think that the reign of the ego is coming to an end. You're either going to surrender to it and get connected to the spiritual, so it will be like homo spiritus is using your five senses plus, plus this connection to the soul and to the spiritual that gives you authentic power, guidance, intuition. You can see that's homo spiritus. That plus the five senses, that's exquisite. Or you're going to resist and try to hold on to what you have and not want to change and look at the past and, and there you're going to suffer. But I tell you what, you can resist all you want. There is no resisting evolution. <laughs> you can resist evolution. You know, oh, yeah. So I tell my students, stop resisting, surrender and elevate yourself. <laughs> So that's what I, that's why I say, okay, well, it, you know, I hope I'll see it um, during my lifetime. I, I don't know if I will, but what is happening now, especially since the pandemic, you know, I moved all my courses on online, obviously. So now I have a worldwide uh, range of people that are suddenly coming to me saying, okay, where do I start? Right. And it's and, and there is this underground current of people yearning and uh, for something else, because this pandemic is like the universe said to us, go to your bedroom and think about what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that's how I view it. It's, um, yeah. <laughs> What would you like? I asked earlier, but I would like, I will insist because I want to to see something. Uh, how do you envision this to to go? The new, the new, uh, the new culture. culture yes. Mm -hmm. Well, right now in our world, and I live in the U.S., right? So it's the priority is money, success, uh, making it. Mm -hmm. um, survival uh, force you know it's a, a little bit of a feeding frenzy on each other i mean you know it's it's really now the homo sapiens is not pretty right it really is uh, quite ugly so um a homo spiritus aggie is somebody that just cares you know just care so when you care there is this caring everybody is included there is this, um, uh, you are for each other instead of against each other. Uh, the new culture for humankind, people have surrendered to the universal law of integrity, right? There is this universal law that is the law of workability, perfect equilibrium. You always reap what you sow. Right? They, they, that's it, right? So most people are trying to mess with that universal law. <laughs> that makes me laugh, sorry. <laughs> you know, be like somebody that uh, is on Earth and say, okay, there is a law of gravity on Earth, but I don't like it. 
I should be able to fly. It's not fair that I, if I jump, I fall on my butt. Spending an entire life resisting the law of gravity will be, I mean, I have never met somebody that will do that, right? But you know, most human beings resist the universal law. Universal, it's not even material law. Universal law of you reap what you sow. So a new culture for humankind will be <laughs> the surrendering to that beautiful universal law that is a perfect equilibrium and harmony in the world. It will be cohesiveness. You know, there is a working together, uh, a togetherness. Uh, gratitude will be uh, the most sought after experience. You know, when you're in gratitude, it's... Uh, you are grateful when you have an unexpected gift, right? Something you didn't plan or something you didn't expect and suddenly you have it and it's delicious. And when you're in gratitude, there is this arising of joy. And for me, I give that is the possibility of world peace because when you're in joy and in gratitude, you're not going to go and kill someone, right? So, so in this new culture for humankind, there is gratitude and joy naturally arising that really allows for the kindness and the harmony that we all yearn for so much. And then lastly, what I see is that the people like you that do podcasts on um, consciousness and thinking consciously and inquiring, the people like me that uh, do the same, um, uh, and Unfortunately, there is so many of us um, would become um, like we look at bankers or lawyers now, you know, that, that, that will be the profession or teachers, you know, at school will be also into like remembering who you really are and being true to who you really are will be one of the main intention of everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's how I dream this new culture for humankind. <laughs> it's great. And uh, I have, uh, I also think of a, a bright humanity ahead rather than, you know, George Orwell style uh, humanity that uh, is kind of presented. And I've been hearing and uh, been involved actually with Terms like new earth and uh, moving from the head to the heart and uh, the Ubuntu philosophy and all those things that are of collectiveness and togetherness and uh, things that up to now uh, you were saying very right earlier about the survival mode and the, the Hopo sapiens that... Uh, does not serve very much anymore. It has proven that it's... Uh, well, we can see what's going on around us and how the yeah. humanity is. Mm. Yeah. Now, the other side of it, Aggie, right? And yes. David, Haw David Hawkins is one of my biggest teacher. But he said to somebody that was saying, okay, we have to save the world. Then he said, why do you want to save the world? This is a school where you have to learn that there is two energy that allows you to elevate. There is either suffering or there is love, right? They are kinetic energy. They move you from one place to the next. So if you do not use love to elevate yourself towards who you really are in the divine, the other option is suffering. So why do you want to stop the suffering? Maybe those people need suffering. If nobody suffers, then maybe they won't be able to elevate themselves. So I was laughing. I think he, he he was also half joking when he said it, but I also got it. I said, you know, Aggie, if we blow ourselves up because we now have the mean to do it, if we don't go to your homo spiritus, I, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, all of it is an illusion, as you said. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, that's right. It's it's incredible. Sophia, I also wanted to ask you about, uh, if you could uh, describe a bit about your book. Uh, I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't read it, but I read, you know, the description and the, the approach of it. And it actually made me want to read it. So can you please share uh, with me uh, what it is about? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. 
I, I'll tell you the truth. So I, um, I, uh, so I went on this spiritual quest. If you remember, I was sharing about it, yes. and then, and then I arrived. My family is in the south of France, and I arrived back. And then, you know, I thought, okay, what's next? And I never do in my life. I'm always being in action. It's very different for me, right? I listen for what wants to happen, and then once I get an intuition or I'm guided, then I step into it and I'm fully in action, right? But I don't force something. So I was there listening for what wanted to happen. And it was clear that I needed to uh, give away what I had learned in the last 30 years. So I had never written a book in my life, but it was great, right? In the south of France to write a book, that was not the hardest (laughs) mission to fulfill. So I started writing and writing and writing and writing. And I felt very exposed because first I started writing philosophically. I'm trained as a philosopher and all that. And I gave it to read to about 20 people that came back with a long face saying to me, we didn't understand a word. I don't know what your book is about. It's right. just right. So I thought, OK, back to the drawing board. So I understood that to write a book that made a difference, I had to put myself in it. Mm-hmm. So then I started writing a biography. And I tell you, I don't know if you've ever written a book about yourself, but you feel totally naked. And I'm used to share about myself, right? I really am used to it. But there on paper, the whole of my life. So I I conceived of a little trick. So I put a heroine that I called Gria, which is really everything about me and my life. Mm -hmm. And then I put a narrator Mm -hmm. that is asking Gria questions. Okay. But I put the narrator as a French person so that I thought that my readers will be a bit misled in thinking that I'm the narrator and not Gria. I see. Right? Yes. Okay. So uh, that gave me a bit of privacy. I thought nobody will know it's my life, but of course. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. So really, it is an autobiography. Uh, everything in the book has really happened. I have not made up anything mm-hmm. about the book mm-hmm. except the role of the narrator. So um, but my students use it for um, distinguishing what the ego is. I use it in my courses because, you know, I am a teacher. A teacher for me is a very sacred uh, space. I only teach what I have personally experienced. If I have not experienced it, I will not give you my view of my, 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 uh, I, I can't because mm-hmm. I haven't experienced it. Mm-hmm. So, um, um, yeah, there is my, my life in that book. Thank you. You reminded me of that story with uh, Gandhi and the, the boy who was eating sugar when you said. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm at, Gandhi is, uh, is one of my heroes. I I just have something with this man. I just have so much respect and awe of him. Mm. Um, Sophie, there are, you know, there are so many different directions that uh, this conversation can go. And uh, now you see me. Sometimes I I'm not entirely sure of where to go next. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> sometimes with with people like you, it's it's challenging to to guide the conversation in a way that uh, you know there is some cohesion and we're not jumping randomly from topic to topic which i was about to many times <laughs> so that's why i'm trying you know to maintain like a, a flow if possible <laughs> um i wanted just one last uh, comment. We mentioned that before, really. You mentioned that before. But somehow I feel compelled to ask for a little bit more about it. And that was the uh, differentiation between pain and suffering. And uh, mm. you mentioned it uh, during the time that uh, uh, you said about that window of opportunity that presents uh, and you were speaking about your mother. So... Mm. Uh, Would you share a little bit more about this pain versus suffering? Uh, Yeah, I I can actually create it, the ego versus the soul. 
That's great. The two yes. worlds, right? Yeah. So that we stay inside of what we're talking about. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so inside, when you are, if you imagine a context like a realm or a world, that's the world of the ego, where you look externally outside of yourself for everything, mm -hmm. like for for um, for love for joy, for happiness, for everything, you look outside of yourself. And then there is a context or a realm or a world where you align with your soul and you know that it's, you are your soul and that's where you get your power from. And you know you are already love, you already are divine, so you don't need to look anywhere for it, you just need to be able to express it. Okay, so those two different worlds. So inside of the ego world, you look, outside for happiness for example right so you'll be happy if you have a new car if you lose weight if you find a partner if you have enough money that will make you happy but as the material world and all the world is in constant movement and mm. constant motion and constantly changes you can see your happiness goes up and down up and down up and down so if you nelson mandela and you are stuck for 28 years in nine square meter jail, you are not going to be happy because your external circumstances are terrible. You're being tortured every week and you can't move. Okay? But then Nelson Mandela walks out of his jail and he's in pure joy. Right? So what, he wasn't happy to be imprisoned but he had access to joy, mm -hmm. right? So joy, internal, connected to the divine, way beyond anything material or anything external. So you can see that language, that is what we use to express ourselves in the world, needs to be very specific. Because one language, you speak of joy, it takes you to the divine, you speak of happiness, it takes you to the ego. You speak of pain, you are in the divine, you speak of suffering, the outside circumstances are running the show. Mm. So language, the more awareness you bring to your word and, and to the world it creates, the more liberated you will be. And it makes sense, Aggie, right? The lawyers have their own language. Doctors have their own language. Philosophers have their own language. Well, if you want to be a homo spiritus, you have to learn the language. Mm -hmm. So it's not what people say to me, oh, it's semantic. No, it's not semantic. <laughs> you always reap what you sow. So pain, you know, my husband died 32 years ago. I tell you, I can talk about my husband, and if I let go and watch a picture of him or share something about him, I will have the sadness and the pain come right up. Mm -hmm. But for me, I welcome it. It's love. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish I could touch him again and smell him and just have one more hug. That would be delicious, right? So I ride the waves, and it disappears. But I don't go to suffering. My life is over. I'll never find somebody that I love as much as him. I, I don't go there. I, I don't, I don't, suffering is not for me. I, I, I don't like suffering. <laughs> I have done my fair share. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you said about the language, and uh, I wanted to add to this uh, that language does not only involve language we use with others, it's the language that we say to ourselves, first of all, more, even more importantly, the, our internal language. Yes, our thoughts, that's language, right? But there is, it's a world of language, right? Uh, uh, mathematic is a language, music is a language. So anything we, we use to create an experience in the material world is language. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very important to bring awareness, but especially to words. Um, uh, you know, this is why communication between human beings is difficult, right? Because we we're very casual with our language. Yes, <laughs> that's a big topic in itself, Sophie, <laughs> about the the language and. Uh... 
yeah, where it uh, where it leads to. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask again. It just came to me. It was not. I didn't think of it at all. When we say language, do you think that different languages affect this process? I mean, I am Greek. Your friends were talking in English. Does it matter at all in this sense that we're talking about, or or does it not? Oh yes, it does. You know, I, I travel. I think to a lot of countries, right? And the language you speak gives you your culture. So, for example, French people, right? So the French language. You need three sentences in French to say one sentence in English, <laughs> right? Because the the language of the French is filled with poesy and and it's a language of the lovers and mm -hmm. of beauty. I mean, if you want to have a quality of life and tenderness and softness, beauty and love, just speak, go to France, speak French. That's the culture. Now, if you want to produce results or do business or go to war or um, even be more pragmatic, you know, like create new things, then English is really good. If you want to go to war, do not go to the French culture. Do not. Right, that, that's not good. <laughs> so there is, on top of everything else, Aggie, that we need to be responsible for the cultural impact of where we are uh, brought up. So, um, why do I live, for example, in the United States? There is a lot of things that don't work in the United States, but there is one thing that I haven't found anywhere else. You go to the United States and you tell them, I want to do that. And they say, you go, girl. Everything is possible. They, they love pushing out the limits and trying new things. Mm -hmm. Everything is possible. And just this is the reason I'm in the United States. Nothing else. Mm -hmm. Because I have not found it anywhere else where there is this energy for elevation. It's fantastic, which mm -hmm. I don't find, for example, in France. In France, they attach to the past and to the beauty. And no, you can't do that. This is not how you do that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I, as much as I love the French people and I love France and I love being with my family, I can't live in France. <laughs> I can relate in uh, different yeah. uh, levels to what you said, having mm -hmm. left Greece mm -hmm. like uh, 11 mm. years ago and uh, maybe mm. I have this cultural uh, uh, element of philosophy because of my Greek language yeah. running yeah. in the background yeah. Yeah. but indeed, I do enjoy indeed. I do enjoy English very much and it mm. has you know replaced in internally the my language uh, yeah but I'm, I'm always curious about these things because not everyone speaks more than one language the majority of people only speak one language and i think it gives you some advantages to be able to think and express yourself in a, in a different language oh it's amazing when i learned english i was 20 and my life expanded immediately right yeah. it's absolutely amazing in fact the more vocabulary you have the bigger the possibility for your life my my husband was South African and he um, created a trust before he died where he he um, created schools for orphan children. And I said, but why do you create schools? Why don't you give them money to do something else? He said, because the most important is the language. The more vocabulary this little one will have, the more they will be able to create their life. And he was right. This is the language is what allows us to create life, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there is no coincidences that you and I are in foreign countries. Being a foreigner somewhere allows you to break free from the ties of a culture because you're not only separate from your own culture a little bit, but on top of that, nobody can understand where you come from mm -hmm. in the new country you're in. So it gives you an enormous amount of freedom. Mm -hmm. I love being a foreigner. It's absolutely delicious, right? And then the other thing is, I have the best of both worlds. I go between the US and France. 
all right, there it is life, sorting itself out. <laughs> That's great, yeah. I, I didn't think that I would be asking you about language, but uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, Sophia, I would like to also ask you some uh, quick fire questions, which uh, I always ask. Uh, the first one I always ask, you've actually... Uh, answered it earlier about uh, the collective fulfillment that personal development is so uh, I'll ask something else if you could knowing what you know now if you could meet your 18 year old self would you give her some advice would you give her one piece of advice um, yes yes definitely what would that be I would say surrender <laughs> surrender and uh, learn what faith is faith in the universe dancing with the symphony of life but this was my biggest uh, most difficult lesson for me I like to control and I'm strong and I try to force things and the day I started surrendering my entire life opened so uh, and understanding what surrendering is it's not submitting it's not giving up your free will mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say to work on one thing, surrendering. That's great. And let's say you had a magic wand and you could change something in the world as it is today. What would you change? Wow. Uh, I don't think... I would, I would make a deconstructing this deconstructing the ego uh, necessary subject at school <laughs> <laughs> that would really change things wouldn't it <laughs> it, it would yeah um i'm always uh, uh, want to give to the listeners some actionable items in, in the podcast because i really believe that uh, we're in an era where there is abundance of knowledge so we can hardly add more knowledge to what there is and I liked very much the wisdom word that you use rather than knowledge uh, so instead of all that I prefer to give action because action is what actually will make the change uh, so what actionable item would you give to the listener something they can pick from this conversation and implement it in their life well, uh, asking themselves one question, put it on the wall and everywhere. Mm -hmm. At the end of my life, when I look back at my life, what kind of human being would I been proud to have been? What kind of human being do I want to be? The one that destroys, salt, complains, or the one that contributes and elevate the global consciousness, right? Even if it's with just the people around you. So that's the main question that amazingly enough, most people don't ask themselves. Like if we don't have a choice. No, we do have a choice. What kind of human being will you be proud of having been during this life? And go out and learn to be that. Mm -hmm. And you know, what I did when I was young is that I... I told you I adore Gandhi. I, I, I modeled myself on Gandhi when I didn't know what to do in life, when I didn't know how to deal with circumstances. I said, what, what would Gandhi do? Mm. <laughs> and I still do it to this day. So that's what I would give my, the your listener. That's great. Thank you. It's uh, very useful to to ask the question first of all and uh, yeah the answer will come <laughs> um, there are so many things really that we talked about and there are uh, a million more <laughs> things that we could have but was there anything that you were really hoping that we would uh, talk about today and completely uh, skipped us I, I, I just I, I just want to say one thing, thank you for giving me the opportunity, is that the biggest suffering for all human beings is that at one point we disconnect from who we really are. And we're very young, right? And when that happens around the age of one or two, we forget that we are divine. 
So then the suffering starts because there is this yearning inside of all of us to, we, you know, we so want to be great. We so want to be nice all the time. We so want to be loving and so want to just be a great human being. And, and we judge ourselves and we have opinion about ourselves that we then put on other people. You know, it's, it's, it's like this, uh, this yearning to be better than what we are. And I just want to say, will you please have compassion for yourself, everybody? Where it starts is by bringing love to yourself. You know, one of my masters said to me, this earth school is really the toughest school there is. You only come back if you're a very advanced soul <laughs> because it is so difficult. So. Um, just to have compassion. I think it is necessary. Um, out of 80,000 people I led to Agi, I've never met a bad person. I only met people that did bad things, mm -hmm. but they were not bad. So that's, that's just what I would like people is just be nice <laughs> to yourself. <laughs> Yeah, we we all, uh, many of us need this reminder from time to time <laughs> about mm -hmm. self-compassion. Um, how can uh, people connect with you and find out more? You mentioned the the call of the uh, soul course, which I'm going to put yeah. in the links. Uh, where else would you direct people? I, I would go and uh, check out my website. Mm -hmm. It's my name, sophiemaclean.com, mm -hmm. so it's easy to find. And on my website, I've uh, put as much as I can, right? So there is uh, the courses I give, there is a free course, there is a book, there is uh, uh, as much as I can put. And then uh, you can even, you know, um, make an appointment with me. So my website will be the place. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this really intriguing conversation and uh, as I was saying earlier I'm, there are so many more things we could talk about but I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to uh, get all this uh, today um, any last parting words from you? Are you going to read my book Aggie? Yes <laughs> <laughs> Alright well I am so happy we had that conversation I'm really delighted to meet you and I really thank you. I listen to some of your podcasts and mm -hmm. I just absolutely adore your uh, kindness and your uh, caring. Um, thank you for being so great with all of us. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and rate it on Apple Podcasts and also share this episode with someone who you think will benefit from it. If you want to find out more about what I do and gain access to exclusive content, join my Facebook group Personal Development Mastery. The link is in the show notes or you can simply type bit.ly slash pdm group. And until next time, stand out, don't fit in. Don't fit in.